<laughs> the map. Oh my God. Okay, so uh, we started in Vientiane. We stayed there for a couple of days. We flew to Odomoxi and we um, joined the Mekong River along here. And my red line is lower than the river because I couldn't actually trace the river. But we basically went from Zen Park to, to Pak, Pakou and then um, to Levang Pong. So that's kind of what this trip did. Um, Green Park Hotel in Bentian, really lovely hotel. This was the bed in the hotel. Um, that first night we went to a bocce ceremony and um, the ceremony um, involves tying cotton um, string on people's guests' wrists and um, wish, wishing them well. And then you're supposed to wear that for three days um, so that the wishes continue. And then you're really supposed to let it fall off, not take it off. And mine was on for a good week. Um, at the, we were in a, a people's home. Um, they made their own, they served us whiskey. The whiskey was quite, um, the whiskey was good actually. And um, this woman was a hoot and she was going around um, sharing, um, serving whiskey to all of us. This is the presidential palace and um, it's closed to the public and um, it's kind of built in a Beaux-Arts style. And um, that's I, what I'm showing you is just a few pictures from Vientiane of things that you would go and do and see um, because the rest of it is just rural things that we did. This is um, the Siwat uh, Temple, the, the, sorry, the Wat Sisakat Temple. It's the oldest temple um, in Laos and it was built in 1818. Um, it's also the oldest standing temple in Laos. There's another um, temple that we went to called Ha Phra Q. I I don't have a photo of that. Um, this was first built in 1565. Um, it was destroyed several times by the Thais, and it was the home of the Green Buddha, but um, the Thais took the Green Buddha to Bangkok. Um, but they still memorialize the, the Green Buddha who's not there in this particular temple. This is the, um, what's, what they call the Art de Triomphe. Um, it's to celebrate the freedom um, or the liberation from France. The funny thing about this was it was built with money from uh, the US and also cement for the US and it was supposed to be used um, to build a runway to their airport. Um, but the prime minister decided that they wanted to build this temple instead. So it's sometimes referred to as the upright runway. This is um, the golden stupa, which was originally built in the third century and then it was um, restored numerous times um, and it's considered the most important national um, site in Laos. And there um, is a, this flying Buddha that um, this is as large as you can imagine um, that it is. It's actually a little hard to photograph, but it was kind of interesting to see. Okay. Um, Laos was very important in the Vietnam War in that uh, the North Vietnamese used um, the run, uh, used part of the country as a way of getting to South Vietnam. And meanwhile, um, the U.S. was trying to stop the North Vietnamese from using that route and also trying to help the South Vietnamese use that route back into North Vietnam. The consequence of all this is that some 80 million bombs, um, or no, sorry, some 2.1 million tons of bombs fell on Laos, the most um, per capita of any country in the world ever. And the US dropped um, a number of bombs that was more than what they had dropped on Europe and Asia in World War II. And some 80 million bombs failed to explode and remain scattered throughout the country. And this, um, Institute is a way of commemorating or and also collecting fundraising for what happened to people. And you can see that the letters are made up of um, 
deconstructed hands and legs and things, things that came um, that were blown up by bombs. And I was really fascinated by this place. Um, this in this museum, um, there was a cluster bomb, and I had heard the term cluster bomb quite often, but I never knew what a cluster bomb was. And you can sort of see what it is if you didn't know what it was before. Um, so you've got um, this thing, which is maybe four feet, I don't have it captured all of it, four feet long. Um, and then all these little, these are bombs. And so it takes off and then it just spreads those bombs all over the place. And so, um, as I said, I was just fascinated. The way they've hung it makes it look like a Christmas tree or something, um, but it's not, it's, um, it's cluster bombs. Um, this museum also helps fund um, orthopedic legs for people. Um, and so then when they get turned in because they're no longer useful, they had made a little collection of that. And then outside of the museum, um, they had built a bronze statue to kind of commemorate um, some of what was going on. The upshot of this part of the trip was it made me read a lot about the Vietnam War, um, which I had not paid attention to when it was going on. This is the um, Green Lake Hotel that we stayed in in Vientiane, a part of it. It was a beautiful hotel. I've looked up the five hotels that we stayed in today, uh, that we stayed in, and all of them are still going. Um, and they ranged in price, if I wanted a room today, which I didn't, but um, the prices range from about $74 to um, $160 Canadian across the variety of hotels. This was one of the more expensive ones we stayed in. Um, we went from the NTN um, to, and we flew to Adoxani, which um, is a, a small village. It has about 350,000 people in it. The total population of um, Laos is about 7.5 million. And Vientiane, which we just saw, um, is the largest city and it has 680,000 in it. So the people live in very small villages and uh, there are developed areas, but there are lots of um, undeveloped areas. And so this was inside um, a family's house and this was the cooking area. And I have no idea what they were cooking, um, but you can see that um, you know, they're doing fires inside and, and one main fire and then cooking things um, at the time. This is um, a house in um, the Adoxamy area and um, they keep the wood and sometimes animals down here. And then um, this is kind of entry to the house and then the house was there. Um, I was not in this house, so I can't really tell you what the rooms would look like excuse me, many of the houses were built very much like this. This was a woman who was washing seaweed. We'd gone into um, this village and we were walking along the village and just uh, talking to people and, and things. And she was washing seaweed and um, that she'd gotten from the river and then she would wring it out. And eventually the seaweed would be turned into flat um, leaps of, of seaweed. Um, this was inside another villager's house. Um, the villagers there were really quite interesting, um, very nice to us, uh, didn't speak very much English, uh, which was not surprising, um, but they were feeding us beer and food and, um, and they just seemed really happy to see us. These were some of the children um, in the village and they were kind of curious about us um, and we're looking at some of my friends who were there. This is a man, um, weaving bamboo straw um, and these would be turned into brooms and also roofs and, and things like that. This is women who are weeding watermelon patches. Um, we're driving now to um, towards Lebanon or we're driving through two villages over the next two days. Um, on our way to um, take a boat ride through the Mekong. And this is a close up of the woman um, as she's weeding uh, the watermelon plants, uh, one of the women. This is um, sunset over the Mekong. And um, we traveled, um, I don't know how many miles, we did it for two days, traveled um, through the Mekong. And it was uh, 
really a, quite a nice, slow, easy trip down the Mekong. This is one of the hotels that we stayed in. It's um, the Charming Laos Hotel. It's actually called the Charming Laos Hotel. Um, and it's in um, a village in Oxme. It's It was quite a beautiful um, place to stay. Um, and when I looked up its prices today, this is well under $100 to stay in it. Um, we ate in its kitchen. We didn't go out to out to dinner um, in this village. We stayed in the hotel. Um, this is the riverboat that we took, um, quite long, and it was just our group that were on the boat, and there were 10 of us, I think, and um, so we could spread out and work on our photos and take photos. This is um, the next village, uh, Whiskey Village, and um, or, and um, so we wandered around the village. And so this is a woman, she's um, weaving um, shawls and um, blankets. This is just another part of the village uh, where family is gathering the little baby here and um, talking to each other and they're kind of watching us as well. This is an overview of the village. So you can see how the houses are really um, on top of each other and, and close together. Um, but it's because it's very mountainous there and, it, and there's lots of trees. So I'm sure when they um, were planning these villages or as villages um, evolved, it had to do with, you know, how much clearing did they want to do and, and that's why they're so close together. This is a, just another view of the, the Mekong um, as we were going down. As I said, it was quite beautiful. This is um, Kamu Lodge. And um, we stayed in tents. This wasn't my tent, but it was similar um, to my tent. So there were kind of luxurious tents there. Um, and that's just the sign. And you had to go up this huge path um, to get there. Nice place to stay though. Um, and then this was the next place. We finally arrived at Le, Le bon, Luang Prabang. And um, we stayed in the hotel there, which um, I, I don't have the name of that right here. Uh, lovely hotel. Luang, Luang Prabang was a really great place to visit because you could walk um, anywhere that you um, wanted to. There were lots to see in the village and the people were really um, quite nice there. One of the mornings that we were there, we went out quite early in the morning. This looks, um, this was when the monks go out um, for alms and they collect food for the, um, where they stay. Um, from the villagers, and we we also took some food, and you, they carry those um, little urns, and you just put food in them. And so they set out in the dark, and they go through the village. And I di I didn't really have a camera good enough to take um, photos that ha um, in the dark, but this was when they were coming back. Um, okay, this was uh, the morning market. So after we had. Um, seen the monks and then we had breakfast. We went to the morning market and um, they sell all kinds of things. This particular woman was selling dried fish and um, and in here were little birds. I don't really know what kind of little birds, but they were little birds. Um, this was some huge fish, as you can see. Um, and so these were more fresh fish. So it's hard to sell fresh fish. It was blistering hot there. Um, but anyway, that was another stall. And then this, so this was in the morning. I think we went maybe around 9.30 in the morning. And so there was all kinds of fried food um, that was being sold. And this is often um, how people get their food, um, particularly in some of these villages. Um, they just go in and pick it up this way um, rather than cook it at home. Now this, I will say of, um, this is true of many of the trips I've taken. So this was another stand with fruits and vegetables. And why does this fascinate me? Because we live here and I never see anything this beautiful here as um, you see in the villages there. We saw so many just beautiful, fresh um, fruits and vegetables um, on this trip and other trips that I've taken in um, Southeast Asia as well. This was the night market in Labang, Labang Parang. We had gone early, so it wasn't yet night, um, but they sold a variety of things in all these different tents and people walked by and you had a mix of both the villagers 
and um, also people who um, were tourists. This just fascinated me because if you look closely, these are Lay's potato chips. Um, all kinds of flavors of Lay's potato chips. I wasn't expecting to see something like that and I just found that interesting. Uh, this was also in Luang, Luang Prabang. We went out one day um, to another section of it and um, we ran into some, before we ran into these boys, we ran into some children who were up on a hill and they were singing Farah Jaka, except they were singing it in um, Laotian, but you could tell what they were singing. That was quite obvious. So we joined them and then we sang it um, both in, uh, we sang it in English to them and they looked at us and they just couldn't believe it um, because I think they thought it was their song. Um, and here we were singing the same song, but in English. Um, so that was kind of fun. So then we wandered around some more and these were just two boys who had been um, pulling some carts with some fruit in them and they were just sitting and taking a break. Um, and it was just with the palm trees and things, it was just a really pretty sight. This was a man who was, uh, you can see he's hammering, that's why it's blurry, um, hammering a, a silver bowl. And um, he just let us watch him for quite a while while he was doing it. He was um, putting the different shapes on the bowl. Um, and th this is one of the last things that we visited. There's several more photos here, but this was called the, lo um, the Long Bridge. And there was a restaurant here that was called the Long Bridge. And so we were sitting in the restaurant, shooting down, taking photos. And so this was the, long bridge connecting one side of the village to the other. And people were constantly crossing this bridge, um, which is, there's only one person on it now, but I can show you some others. Um, so um, also in that area, uh, these were monks in a boat just going down. Um, and this was my first trip to Southeast Asia. And so monks just fascinated me at the time. Um, they're kind of less fascinating now just because you can see them everywhere, but at the time, um, that was just something that was really different for me. Um, here are some monks who had crossed the bridge and they were now walking uh, to the other side of the village um, and, and carrying goods with them. Here are not the same ones, but some monks coming back and it was quite, it was hot, but it was quite windy that day. And you can see that, um, that the robes are just um, flying all over the place. Here's just another shot of that. Okay, I, there's only a few more pictures, but this is an, another important story to me. So we were wandering around one day in Levant, Rabang, and um, not the whole group, about five, five or six of us out of the group were together and we could hear this party going on. It was the middle of the afternoon. It was actually Valentine's Day, although I don't know if it was Valentine's Day for them, but, um, and there was this block party. And so we, they were in a, a like a small, a very small park, very, very small park. And um, they were talking to each other and, and they were dancing, they were playing games. I'll show you a little bit of that. And um, we just stayed um, off to the side for a little while and just took photographs. I mean, it was obvious what we were doing um, and they didn't seem to mind. And then one of, uh, one of the people who was there came over and talked to us and it turned out he was Korean and he became sort of, the, though he now lived there or was living there, um, he became the translator for us. So he told us um, a little bit about the village and he told us that they were having a celebration but we couldn't really understand what kind of celebration it was. And then they offered us beer and, um, cause they were drinking beer. And so we decided that we would drink beer because it was coming out of bottles. And so we felt that that was, um, relatively safe and they gave us cups and, um, and they were just having a good old time. Then um, some of them sort of in that same area where you saw the, the other couple dancing, um, they were playing, I would call it bocce ball. I'm not sure it was bocce ball, but it was something like that. And um, they spent quite a long time doing that. Also mentioned, just going back to this photo for a bit, um, they then, after they were showing us how to do this dance, they all, they pulled us into the circle and turned us up with them uh, and tried to teach us this dance. I cannot dance, but, but it was terrible. But anyway, they were having fun. And then this is some of the food um, that they brought out. And as I said, it was like a little block party or something. And what was amazing was um, this was some of the food that they put out for us. The, 
the men and women were sitting at separate tables and we ended up sort of at a table, not with them, probably because, um, I mean, the language barrier was huge, but they invited us to, to eat their food and, and they made a table of food for us. Um, I was not willing to, I don't, do not have a good stomach um, and I was not willing to eat the food, um, but I thought it was really great that they did this. So here they were giving us beer. At one point, they actually, some of them had to go out because they ran out of beer because six additional people had shown up that they weren't really planning on having to show up. And um, so they went and they got some more beer and they gave us more beer. And every time our beer would get to about this height, they'd come and refill our beer. And so we're sitting, we were there for a couple of hours by this time. And we're trying to figure out how we're gonna get out of there because we don't wanna leave full glasses of beer on the table because that would be rude, but they keep filling it. So I came up with a plan. And the plan was that all of us were to take our cups and, and drink to about here and then chug the rest immediately and then stand up to go. And that's what we did and it worked. Um, and they thanked us for coming. And um, they said that they had been really impressed with us because most people who would come by into that situation, most tourists would have just kind of gawked, take a few photos and left. Whereas we stayed and we tried to find out some about them. And we, I don't think any of us played bocce ball, but um, we tried to dance. We uh, drank beer with them. Some of my colleagues, uh, some of my friends did eat the food. As I said, I didn't. Um, but that was it. And then as we were leaving, we asked them if we could give them any money uh, for the beer, which we would have been happy to do. And they absolutely refused to take any money from us, absolutely refused. And um, I've encountered this now several times uh, where I've crashed parties with some of the other photographers. And, um, you know, if somebody walked into my house off the street and started eating my food and I didn't know who they were, I would call the police. Um, but they're, they, they're just sharing um, and they're happy to share and they don't care that they don't know you. Um, and it's just wonderful. So that's just, um, I'm sorry that it got off to a bad start, but that's um, kind of how the trip went. And um, it was a really fascinating place to go. And um, as I said, it really grounded me in some ways to learn more about um, the Vietnam War and sort of the history of that area, um, because it was stuff that I really didn't know much about. Good. Thank you very much, Nancy. Did you want to unshare your screen? Okay, uh, let's stop sharing. There we go. I'm still sharing. Okay. I think we got it now. Very good. You did it. <laughs> so, when was this trip, Nancy? Oh, yes. So, it was um, February of 2015. Okay. And that's why I was kind of surprised a little bit when I checked all the hotels today just to do that, and they were all still going. I might not have necessarily expected that to be true, and it looked like some of them had actually expanded and built new rooms and things. Good. Has anybody else been to Laos? We were there about three years ago, and we were bicycling from um, Vietnam through Cambodia to Laos along the course of the Mekong and it, it was a fascinating country. We we stayed um, at a, a bed and breakfast in, in uh, Luang Prabang and it was owned by a fellow who owned a restaurant that sold insects. Only insects. Only insects in town. We didn't actually eat in his restaurant and he cooked for us at home and uh, we didn't have to eat insects. But um, that was uh, in interesting but it was, it was a very nice place to but stay. I'm sure we went to ex the, exactly the same market that you did Nancy but we went with one. him mm -hmm. and what was so fascinating there was that he, not a single plastic bag was used for anything. He, he had woven baskets and he would argue quite vociferously with the people who were selling presumably to get the best price on the greens and so forth and then he would just he would pay he would never let us pay for anything he pay and he would put it in his basket which he carried on his arm and we'd move to the to the next yeah, person no so not a single piece of plastic what took place in um in those transactions um i visited laos in 1995 uh 
And actually, I am a professor emerita from Asian studies, and Southeast Asia is my region, even though mainland Southeast Asia is not. My language and country is Indonesia. Um, what I saw in your pictures and the hotels was very different, at least from also where I stayed. And I don't think sort of the luxury hotels weren't there in 1995. Um, Laws, except for being well known as being landlocked, it's also one of the still very strict communist totalitarian countries. And so, uh, one question when, when I was there, I felt that was very present, it was very uh, difficult to. I, I, I traveled just on my own. Um, almost like PhD student like backpack, um, but it, it was very hard to um, yeah feel some sort of freedom, so to speak. People were interested in US dollars uh, rather than their own currency. But I so I was just and I know that since ninety five, so we're twenty seven years down the road, and I haven't been back since. Uh, I know that China's influence is tremendous in build, building infrastructure and whatnot and making laws for that reason very dependent on China. So I wonder to what extent you uh, experienced any of that or felt, felt that? No, I'd have to say not really. Now, I was in a group, to be fair, and um, we had a guide who stayed with us the whole time. And so he, I don't know if you could say ran interference. I wouldn't say that. He was teaching us a lot of stuff. We did wander around three or four different, at least three or four different villages. Um, and we just wandered around. And maybe because these villages were so remote, uh, people talked to us or, I mean, tried to talk to us, obviously, and the, the guide could communicate with them. So he would do that and, and help us understand things. But um, I felt that it was a lot of freedom. And in Vientiane, um, I wandered around my, during the day, not at night, but during the day by myself. And I thought that was fine. So I'm not sure. Um, and, and maybe it was just the villages that we were in. One of the things that we came up against was what was happening with the Mekong River, because the, the Chinese are building a large number of dams along the river. And these are going to even out the flow, which is going to severely affect what farmers can do and what fishermen can do. Because I think about half the protein that's eaten in Cambodia, for example, is, comes from the waters of the, the Mekong. Um, and with all those dams in place, the Ton Le Sap, which is a seasonal filling lake that fills up from the Mekong and then empties again, will cease to be it's a fertile. That, that's, that's, that's in Cambodia. That's in Cambodia. And then further down, um, mm -hmm. in fact, all the way up and down, the, there's the seasonal fishing. And, and I'm, I'm personally very worried about what will happen there. And with, with rising ocean levels, the lower reaches of the, the Mekong will probably become uninhabitable. So what, what happens with the Mekong is supposed to be part of a, of a multinational collaboration, but I gather it doesn't work that well. I don't know, Tanika, if you, if you found, if you know anything about that. No, no, honestly, I, I don't know. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised that what happens there is not in the interest of the Lao people, mm -hmm. definitely. And again, as what, um, I have some high related friends here who are far more on top of what's happening also in Laos and um, and and their general assessment is that that China definitely um, has a, a tremendous tremendous um, not power but no I mean there Laos is in debt to to China so, you know, also then what, what happens to the water, the, that kind of control and so on. It's, um, I mean, it, it laws, I just, I, I just looked it up. I wouldn't remember that, but like it ranks 82nd of, out of 121 in terms of the, the hunger index on the, in the world. So, um, and, and generally it is of course a country that is, there's very little known and 
we never hear much about it in the news. Actually, mm. but one other thing that I wanted to say is when I traveled, one of uh, the the things I noticed were were people um, who were had clearly disabilities uh, still as a result of the war and the, and land landmines were also a, an, an issue that was still discussed at the time. One of the things I read was that there's still about 50 people a year killed by landmines. Um, they've done a lot of cleanup, but they certainly haven't cleaned up all of it. So that is still an issue that yes. that's so such a sad situation. Yes. But it was, I think I read um, 1.2 tons of bombs per person um, were dropped. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was just extraordinary. It covered everything. Yeah. yeah I, I like to know the landmine. How do they, how is it being planned to clear the landmines? Because obviously it's such a big number and must have been, must has must require a lot of uh, effort. Uh, is it the international, multinational kind of effort or by the local government or how? It's been an international effort. You may, I mean, it's a long time ago now, but you may remember Princess Diana was actually quite involved in that. And some of that work has continued in a variety of ways. So it's, it's not just um, the country. I think the US has been somewhat involved because they were responsible for dropping a lot of those bombs. Um, and then the result of damage. So it's a continuing effort. So the carpet bombing was, was all about. That was in Vietnam. That was in Vietnam. But, then but the, that's the, the same thing went on in Cambodia. Cambodia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's something, something similar in Vietnam too? <laughs> Well, the, the trip that Peter was just telling you about ended with just a few days in Laos, but mostly it was a cycling trip through Vietnam and Cambodia. And a museum in in um, Vietnam that we went to was called the American War Museum. Of course, we, we refer to it as the Vietnam War, but they refer to it as the American War, which is a much more appropriate title, I think. And um, in that museum, there was some of the most distressing images I've ever seen anywhere. Uh, there, there were um, two huge rooms of galleries of paintings by children of th their friends who had lost their limbs um, because of um, Agent Orange being sprayed. Uh, that, that, that was heartbreaking. But the, with regard to the bombing, they had, um, they had a lot of depiction of what was going on, a photographic depiction of what was going on at the time. And one of the in incredible um, scenes were aerial aerial shots of what it looked like after carpet bombing. This is, you know, this is a an American. My understanding is that this was an American idea to to just intimidate people. It, it, it did not go after um, areas of of governmental or military importance. It went for people, and they. It looked like it, 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 if it was on the skin of a person, it would have been somebody with the most terrible skin disease. It, just all over holes, 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 and and the debris everywhere. So, you know, it's distressing sometimes to go to some of these countries. There, there are many beautiful things, and there's a lot, a lot to learn. But, uh, but there's a there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of negative history in in most places that we get to visit, whether it's in Europe or Asia or wherever. And I think it's it's incumbent on us if we're going to go there and travel that at least we try to understand a little bit of uh, what those people have gone through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say it was the Allies in World War II who perfected carpet bombing. It was not a new idea in yes. the 60s, but terrible idea nonetheless. Yes. If I could just make a comment on a completely different plane and, and <laughs> descending from what I've found to be very interesting discussions by people who really know the area but just to talk about beer for a moment i heard <laughs> i heard nancy say that you know she saw the beer being opened and had no problem drinking it i had a colleague in civil engineering who worked in the area of well waste disposal actually but he he said that the two the two things that are safest to drink when you're traveling are beer and coca-cola so if there's nothing else available make your choice from one of those 
for what it's worth to a group of travelers who probably all knew that anyway. And I would say beer would be better, much better than Coca-Cola. Uh, better for you, but not necessarily better protection from oh, water. Oh, yeah. Water I water. guess if they are the same protection, then beer would I, be much better. I agree. I agree. We're one mind on that. <laughs> so is tourism ranking very high as their uh, one of the, the major industry for the national income? Revenue? That's now? Nice. That today, and I can't remember the number, but I think it's like about 15 to 20 percent. Um, it's been growing since even since I've been there. Um, and again, maybe because I, in, in my world, I feel like my world has been shut down for two years because of COVID. So, you know, so I'm shocked that anybody's doing anything. Um, but they were certainly um, expanding during this time. So that was, I mean, between two. If it, in 2022. So um, and I didn't look up the COVID statistics. So I don't know anything about that. Okay. Well, Nancy, uh, thanks very much for the presentation. I know we had some difficulties to start with, but it worked out fine in the end and obviously stimulated a lot of interest among the audience members. Yes.